Welcome everybody to another Big Scale Alliance podcast. Today we're joined, as usual, by Peter Merrill and by Francis Liu. So today we're going to talk about ecosystem thinking. Yes, um, which I think a lot of people have been hanging out waiting for ever since we recorded the, the first four principles webinars uh, a couple of years back. Uh, the, the fifth principle and the sixth principle, triple loop learning and ecosystems thinking, in Xcale, Xcale being an acronym, um, we didn't really have enough of a grasp on the material to be able to say concrete things about these things. So uh, that's, that's why we're getting um, our feet under us now with this. And some of what we're going to look at is still wet behind the ears. So part of the reason that we are doing this in a podcast now is to try and gather community feedback. So if you look at any of what we're doing and go, you guys are plum loco, we probably are. And we would very much appreciate your input. Francis, do you think that's a fair summary of the state of the art? Absolutely. We're going to get that material out, get some eyeballs on it early. Sounds good. Okay, so Stefan, uh, am I right in saying that, that you're not familiar with any of this material, very little of it? Uh, very little, I would say. So I'm as curious as all the other um, participants. So, cool. Well, well, then let's get into it. Um, as per usual, we're going to do a bit of exposition up front, and then we're probably going to have rather more interactive stuff going on than in some of our previous um, webinar slash podcasts. Uh, partly because, well, it's wet behind the ears, and partly because it would be more fun. I don't know if any of you know what you're looking at here, and anyone who's listening in a podcast mode won't be seeing it, so perhaps I should describe what these strange green circles mean. Um, this is industrial agriculture, and what you see is a, a pattern of uh, squares and circles, and it looks very higgledy-piggledy. The reason for the circles is that in industrial agriculture, uh, we irrigate fields using um, these machines that use water pressure to go around in a circle and then drip water on the ground. It, it doesn't look very much like a, uh, a natural construct. It looks very artificial. It looks like funny looking wallpaper. Um, so the reason that uh, I, I'm showing this picture is because I, I want to beg a question. Um, and the question is, what's the difference between an ecosystem and any old system? Uh, Stefan, Francis, would you, would you care to, to venture a guess? I have got it on the screen at the moment, but nevertheless, go ahead. My take would be simple. An ecosystem is self-sustaining. You know, uh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Francis, would you go with it? I think it's uh, a, a, so an ecosystem is uh, multiple systems that have relationships between them. Yeah, I, I like both of those definitions. Um, so I, I like to say that they're networks of mutual benefit because I think that it sort of sums up both of those ideas. Um, I, I gave an example at uh, the... Lean and Agile Systems Thinking Conference uh, last week. Uh, but we only had a, a five-minute lightning talk on this, and uh, a, a story sprang to mind uh, from, um, well, uh, my, my wife comes from Minnesota, from, from farmland, and uh, so there was a, a story that came from Minnesota about a farmer who had won the best ear of corn 20 years in a row. And at the local agricultural show, people were astonished that anyone would be able to win it two years in a row, much less 20 years in a row. And everyone was trying to find out, I'm going to call him Farmer Brown. I don't really know what his name was. Farmer Brown's secret. How on earth had he done this? Was there something special in the, in the fertilizer? Did he have some weird voodoo plants from South America? What had he done? And uh, people spied on him. Uh, people tried to wheedle it out of his, his family. No one... No one was able to discover it. Finally, Farmer Brown retired, and uh, uh, the local reporter came around from the local newspaper and sat him down and said, look, um, Farmer Brown, 
we understand this is something that, that you've come up with yourself and you don't have to share it with us, but it would be such a shame if you, if you didn't. This is such a, a great boon to the community. If you could just tell us how have you been winning the best year of corn 20 years in a row? And Farmer Brown said, no doubt with a, an accent I cannot possibly reproduce. Um, he said, actually, I, I didn't even try to do it. I didn't set out to do this. Um, really, it was just that, you know, I, 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 my, my neighbours are very good neighbours and I, I like to take care of them. And so um, when I won the first year, I, um, I went to them and I shared my best seeds with them. And the reporter was aghast and said, you gave your best seeds to your neighbours. And Van Brown said, yes, it was only the second year that I realised why it was such a good idea. You see, their plants pollinise my plants. So if they have the, the best corn then uh, all around me, then I, I will have the best corn. And that's, that's what happened. So that idea of mutual benefit, um, we very seldom see that inside most of our client corporations. But that isn't to say it isn't a good idea. Uh, it's just that we haven't set up for it. And if you um, hark back to the Agile Game Theory podcast we had uh, about a month ago, uh, you'll see some ways to go about it. But in this podcast, we're going to think about things a bit differently. And to, to think about it differently, we're going to have to zoom in a little bit. Um, so now we're, we're looking at, we can see the circles still, and we can see these strange square things in between them. Those square things are... Um, cattle pens. So it's a fair question as to um, whether there's actual mutual benefit going on here. We can certainly see that the, the cattle are benefiting from the chaff and the leaves and so on that have been taken from the agricultural produce. But uh, whether the cattle are producing the fertilizer, well, they're not producing the fertilizer for, um, for the for the crops, they, they couldn't produce so much fertilizer. Uh, that's part of the reason it's industrial agriculture. Uh, most of the NPK fertilizer on the crops here is not coming from cattle, it's being mined. Uh, so the idea in an ecosystem is that the more different species that are generated, the more different relationships between those species, the more stable the ecosystem is with changing constraints. Well, with industrial agriculture, uh, we know this isn't stable with changing constraints. We've seen dust bowls and droughts and floods wipe farmers out. Uh, and we've seen various kinds of pests wipe them out. We've seen uh, some of the output of industrial agriculture generate non-sustainable outcomes. I'm thinking here of glyphosate. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to take issue with that, uh, I suggest you go and uh, look up some of the studies that have just demonstrated that it is indeed a human carcinogen, uh, but let's not go there. So if we look at industrial agriculture and ask ourselves, is this an ecosystem? Well, perhaps in the sense of Farmer um, Brown uh, sharing seeds, but most of what we see uh, seems to be organized hierarchically. Um, and it's not just a two level hierarchy. If we zoom in again, we can see that, well, in the middle of all of those large cattle pens, there is this nasty swamp of algae that's uh, consuming the runoff from the pens. And um, it's probably the only organism that could because the cattle naturally concentrate the pesticides and, and, and herbicides and uh, the, the, um, the parts of fertilizers that uh, aren't actually part of a natural cycle um, and the antibiotics that they're injected with. So there's lots of substances coming out of those beasts running into this central sump area and, well, nothing else can eat it. So what we have here, uh, it, it seems like a, a kind of an icky idea what we're looking at. I mean, it can't smell too good. Uh, algae itself, can be farmed and it, it, there's there are ways forward um ecologically for humans that involve algae culture but that's a different story here what we're looking at reminds me more of uh, a study that credit suisse did in 2011 of the ownership relationships between 
banks and corporations of all sorts, the large corporations. They studied 35 million corporations all around the world, publicly traded corporations, and they graphed the ownership relationships between these corporations. And they discovered a couple of remarkable things. One of the things they discovered was that uh, all of the 35 million, well, almost all, were majority owned by a clique of just 14,000. Well, less than uh, 0.05%, something like that, of the 35 million owned all of the rest. And so it's a little bit like the, the cattle yards uh, consuming all the, the, most of the biomass from the fields. Obviously, some of the biomass goes off to, uh, to humans in the form of, of, um, of, of uh, food crops. But quite a lot of it is only consumable by animals that are able to digest cellulose, which is to say cattle. Um, but there was another disturbing thing about the Credit Suisse study in 2011. They found that that group of 14,000 was controlled by a cabal of 147 companies. Uh, that, that, that group of 147 controlled uh, at least a 40% share in each of the 14,000. And the cabal, those companies, all mutually owned each other. Now, I'm not big on conspiracy theories. I think this is just a natural way that um, human systems uh, tend to work when they're, they're not regulated to eliminate the tragedy of the commons. And again, if you are interested in that kind of tragedy, you should look up our Agile Game Theory podcast from a month ago. So that central cabal, that's the banks and the big farmers and big media, and uh, all of the usual suspects. There's no surprises about the company names in that group of 147. There might be surprises if we could look at the board membership. But um, it's a little bit like this nasty patch of algae in the middle. Uh, they're, they're not really producing anything of value for the rest of the ecosystem. They're simply sitting there and consuming. So if we were able to farm the algae, well, we might do considerably better than a lot of our food crops. Algae can more than double its biomass in just 24 hours. But again, that's a, a different story. So in a, an ecosystem, um, the more different relationships that are supplied, the more productive the ecosystem is over time. And you can think of the Amazon as perhaps the, the zenith of this, or perhaps um, some of the world's oceans before we set up industrial fisheries. The point, though, is um, if we don't have too many relationships, then we're quite wobbly. So when we think about business ecosystems, things like um, Apple's ecosystem of all of the, the billion applications in the world, or, or Facebook's, or Google's, or Amazon's, uh, and you might think, well, Amazon's one way like this, but it's not. Only it's retail operation, and even there, it's connecting many small suppliers with many small consumers. So it's actually a very rich ecosystem. But when you consider their cloud APIs and so on, it's richer still, and of course, that's where they make most of their money. So, most of all, when you have this kind of concentration of control, then it's very easy for catastrophes to occur. And we can think of this central swamp as a catastrophe uh, in that, well, pretty obviously, that road around it, that round road, it was originally straight. This thing is growing, and this is a symptom of the unsustainability of agriculture, uh, well, industrial agriculture, all over the world. Are you guys with me so far? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Cool. All right, so I will go on. Um, I promise I'll get to the interactive part soon. All right, how can we think about designing healthy ecosystems? Uh, there is a game that was invented uh, 4,000 years ago in China by a fellow named the Duke of Wen. Uh, the Chinese call it Wei Qi. It's better known uh, in the West by its Japanese name, which is just Go, G-O. And um, this is the most complex game that humans play. Uh, it's played on a 19 by 19 board where any move is legal at any time. 
And while the rules themselves are very, very simple, incredibly simple, not much more complex than, than noughts and crosses, tic-tac-toe, um, because of the fact that each stone that's played influences the value of all of the other stones, they basically co-evolve the structures on a go board. Um, coming to grips with this is much more um, strategically difficult than uh, chess, where you only have to think about an eight by eight board and there's only a few legal moves. So when you play Go, there is a fundamental strategy that you need to master to be able to win. I'm not proposing to teach anyone Go in the next 30 seconds. But the, the basic idea is that, well, black and white take turns placing stones at the intersections of the board. Uh, they never move the stones. Uh, they just take turns, one white stone, then one black stone, and so on. And the way to look at the board uh, in a biological metaphor, you can imagine there is a, an oxygen source available for every intersection of horizontal and vertical lines where you, is where you play those stones. And that oxygen supply is almost, but not quite enough, to keep one stone alive there. So as long as you understand that stones of the same color that are connected by horizontal or vertical lines can share that oxygen supply, then the fact that a group of stones might only have a few connections to the outside world where they can get enough oxygen to keep all of their stones alive, um, uh, that isn't much of a problem. But if they get completely surrounded by stones of the other color, then effectively they strangle. So the biological metaphors with this game are very strong. And what's really interesting about it is that as we go along playing Go, as there are more and more stones on the table, on the board, we get more and more sharper and sharper constraints. So when you play, this one rule that you must use to be able to not lose at Go, it doesn't guarantee you're going to win by any stretch of the imagination. This rule is called whole board thinking. And the idea is rather than trying to respond directly to the other player's last move, you want to start by focusing, by broadening your focus to look at the entire board. And since there are many fights going on on a go board at once, and there are also many uh, bits that are basically empty, they're unplumbed potential, um, you have to evaluate which of these parts of the board holds the greatest potential for development. And once you've decided which part of the board that is, then you look at what are the strategic forces coming from the other parts of the board, and you start to, to then narrow your focus uh, as you understand which of those strategic forces are important, which aren't. And then finally, you can think tactically. You can get down to the chess level. Um, and then, so you play at one stone, and your, the other player plays one stone. You have to pop your focus back out to the whole board again. If you don't engage in that discipline of always going out to the whole board. If you just respond to the other player's stone, then you will invariably lose. The other player will lead you around by the nose. So this is this short-term thinking is unfortunately extremely common in um, product management. And it's very common in the way that people go about transformations as well. We think about symptoms. We don't think about root causes. We think about uh, individuals, we don't think about the network of trust binding them together. And again, I'll refer back to that um, Agile Game Theory uh, podcast for examples of how to quantify these things. The old hippie maxim of think globally, act locally, that's, that's what this whole board thinking principle is about. But it's only one principle that's important to the health of an ecosystem. And so what we're going to look at uh, in about five minutes, is uh, a whole set of these principles that derive from the work of two Australian environmentalists, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. Uh, Mollison uh, passed away in 2016. Holmgren is very much alive and kicking and has been kind enough to give us some feedback on the ecosystems thinking ideas we're going to review here already. So I'm hoping we're going to get considerably more, because it's a very active global uh, learning ecosystem uh, based in the permaculture principles. And what we're doing in trying to adapt them to corporate organizations is basically heresy from the point of view of that ecosystem, because they're really not very interested in um, 
big corporate. They're very interested in small holding farms, in very humane, green change ways of living. So it's been enormously generous of them to uh, extend their thinking to um, uh, endeavors that might not be ecologically, biologically, ecologically sustainable. Um, nevertheless, I think, and I think they think, that there's mutual benefit to be had there too. And that by exploiting it, uh, we can actually do things that can make the entire ecosystem, uh, the technological, the um, economical, and the ecological, uh, to make the whole thing into something that's sustainable. Now, I know that's woolly-minded, utopian thinking. Uh, nevertheless, it's a good intent to have, because otherwise we'll strangle on our own wastes. So um, for now, uh, I guess I'm asking the listeners to um, suspend their disbelief as we dive into this stuff, P partly because even if you have a purely uh, financial interest in improving your organization, well, there's an enormous amount of value in permaculture, and hopefully we're able to maintain that in its adaptation to agile organizations. All right. Um, one more bit of exposition and we'll, we'll dive in, guys. So, first bit of exposition has to do with trying to make this less about um, uh, farming. Uh, I, I want to look at the design of an ecosystem. And this is an example taken from our XPM course to do with the design of iPhone, not iPhone the device, iPhone the ecosystem. We want to understand markets as ecosystems. And the first problem we've got is that the Devices, um, they kind of distract us. There is a, a structure to markets. Uh, we, when we talked about pirate canvas, we started to look at that structure. Uh, markets are not flat. The Kano diagram, we, I don't know if we've touched on Kano or not. I think we have when we're looking at the, the product management practice patterns in Xcale. Um, it's not flat and it's not static. So it's um, a, a moving a uh, highly dimensional surface. In the diagram we're looking at here, it, it looks three-dimensional. If we uh, imagine that the, the z-axis, or z-axis, depending on where you come from, um, is uh, satisfaction or uh, market impact, uh, well, the x and y-axis are vast numbers of uh, design dimensions all squished into a plane. Uh, so what we'd like to do with this is let's take the devices out of the picture. If we're going to describe how to design an ecosystem, we're going to have to do that. We have to understand ecosystems in terms of networks of mutual benefit. So uh, if we're just thinking about how to improve an existing device, if we're focusing on user experience design or design thinking that focuses on solving an individual problem, that we're going to wind up in a bad place. Um, I, I, I think, I don't know if we did use the example, I'll use it again. Design thinking has been applied to um, ecological problems with a very checkered history. Uh, and the, the best example I think was the village in Africa where when the design thinking people turned up, they went, aha, the biggest problem here is that there's a very high incidence of malaria. So they, um, they did all the design thinking stuff about um, uh, getting feedback from the, the, the customers, again, the customer's point of view properly represented and, and prototyping and test, you know, all the stuff that goes into design thinking. And, um, and they decided, okay, the best solution, uh, we believe, having trialed it, is, uh, DDT is DDT is a cheap pesticide. It's not necessarily very good for the environment, but um, it's not very good for humans. But uh, it's, it's cheap enough for us to use here, and it's certainly much better than uh, allowing the malaria to go on. So uh, they, they were able to buy some of this stuff and, and spray all of the herbage around the, uh, the village and it, it got rid of the pests, sure enough. And then when the rainy season arrived, all of the huts all over the village, every single one, lost its roof. All the roofs collapsed because it turned out that there was a beetle whose larvae ate a fungus and the fungus was the fungus that affected thatched roofs. So without thinking breadth first about ecosystems, we can often create far worse problems than we are solving. But I said I was gonna get away from the biological and get to technological and the design of iPhone. 
So most people, when they think of the design of iPhone, think about this lovely experience of touching the glass multi-touch screen and having it respond to you. That's not where it started. It started with a decision uh, by Steve Jobs to take all of the Apple product lines out of the big box stores, out of CompUSA and the malls. They were in 11,000 CompUSA stores. They did some mystery shopping. They discovered that um, the sales staff in CompUSA were inducing customers to compare Apple devices with cheap Chinese MP3 players. They knew that if that happened with phones, given that iPhone was going to be the most expensive phone on the planet, uh, that they the market impact they needed. So you might think, oh, well, that's just a business decision. That's it's a bit of a marketing decision. That's got nothing to do with design. Well, they had to build bricks and mortar stores, and they built them as machines. Uh, the the Apple retail stores are the most expensive retail real estate on the planet. And they are full of monitoring devices to make certain that at that precise moment, just when you have picked something off the shelf and you've gone, no, you know, I actually think this is probably the right thing to buy. That is when the Apple genius materializes out of thin air and says, well, sir or madam, uh, would you like some help with that? So the engineering that went into uh, the Apple stores is astonishing. Uh, all of the backroom systems as well, it's all automated. So, um, and then the scripts and all of the retail supply chains, all of the billing, it was an enormous engineering project. And it began with Braun Stroke's ecosystem design. So it's an acquisition play. You're trying to acquire customers. So take the product out of the big box stores. Then, well, then we have another um, part of iPhone's design that most people don't even think of as iPhone. And this was a, a strange little device. It was a cable. It was a little white cable that allowed you to suck your entire iTunes library down into your phone in one fell slurp. Uh, and the amazing thing about this was it also charged the phone. Uh, it was it was actually absolutely indispensable. It was amazing uh, that, that you could get that much bandwidth, that much information squirted from one device to another down this tiny little cable. Before that, all of the cables were, were ribbon cables and they were very unwieldy things and that it, it would take you quite a long time to transfer your data. So why did they do that? Why did they focus that much design and engineering effort on a little white cable? Well, it was because it was part of their activation strategy. It wasn't just the cable, but the cable meant that the moment that you plugged your phone in, you would be able to get your credit card number bound to the AMEI number, the SIM card number in the phone. And that meant that your phone could bill you for things without going through a telco. Now, at the time, Every telco on the planet had conditions in their contract that meant that any equipment manufacturers would have to bill via the telco's um, phone bill. And that meant that the telcos were able to suck up 90, 95% of the value that was paid by the customers for the software or the content. Uh, Apple had to give enormous sweetheart deals to a telco in every market. AT&T is the one most people recall. Um, so they'd be willing to do that. And again, that was all about this activation play. It was about how do we have a seamless experience of turning our customers who are presently buying songs for pennies into our customers who are buying devices for hundreds of dollars uh, at a stroke, multiplying the value of our ecosystem by a factor of 10,000. It was clever. So then we've got... Um, the obvious, the, the screen. Now, most people would go, oh, well, that was a retention play. It was all about uh, making certain that, that the customers will um, keep, and will never go back to the BlackBerry phones. It was a retention play, but it wasn't about that. It was about making certain that people's children would drag them into the Apple stores over and over and over again to play flappy birds or angry birds or whatever kind of birds. Uh, uh, they were getting 
people to enter and re-enter and re-enter the Apple ecosystem. That's retention. So yes, it did indeed work to also retain the customers uh, who tried the phone out because after you'd had the experience, you'd go, oh, you know, that was an awful lot nicer. But the main thing was it was it kept people coming into the stores. They became little mini amusement parks. It was like a little fair, a little circus. There was a referral play uh, to do with iMessage, and, uh, which was the free SMS, but only for iOS users. And find my friends. Both of those were uh, incentives for parents to go, you know, if I was to buy a phone, an iPhone, for little Johnny or little Jill, um, I would always know where they are. And I wouldn't have to pay these astronomical SMS bills anymore. The phone would pay for itself in the first year. It's effectively free. So it was a very big Christmas for Apple that year. And finally, um, there was this thing called the App Store. It obsoleted an entire industry without anyone worrying about it too much. But the whole point of that was not return in the sense of making Apple a lot of money. I did make them a lot of money, but compared to the amount of money they were spending on the phones, it was a, it was a pittance. Um, the people were spending on the phones. Uh, the phones were, were very expensive and the apps were not. And then they got 30% of, of the value of the apps. But the return for them was developer mindshare. That was why they were so generous on terms. The developers had been used to the idea that if they wanted to sell their software, it would go onto a shelf in a retail store and the, 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 the people who boxed it up and the people who put it on the shelf would have to get their bit. And if they were lucky, the developers would get 30% of the retail value of the software. All of a sudden, they could get 70% of it. Turn the equation on its head. And so that's why there were a, a billion apps for, for the App Store so rapidly. And that's how they were able to suck in so many people so rapid. That's why it went off faster than any other product in the history of the universe. So, except possibly Domino's Pizza, but that's a different story. So that's all lovely. It gives us an idea that ecosystem design has to precede experience design. But I want to get back to permaculture. Um, now, we are looking at a diagram of um, a permaculture farm. And if you recall the industrial agriculture diagram we were looking at before, this doesn't look anything like that. You can see all these beautiful curves and swoops. Uh, the farm is optimizing yield uh, according to the different kinds of uh, soil and wind and moisture conditions in different parts of the terrain. It's designed to maximize yield for a small holding. It's quite human intensive, but that's all right because it more than supports the humans who live on it. And again, this is not like industrial agriculture. The basic model for permaculture is um, uh, what Mollison, I think, I, I never know which one of them said which, uh, called a, a food forest. Imagine a, a rainforest. Rainforests are these incredibly lush environments. But imagine it uh, with a selection of trees and plants and animals um, all of whom produce uh, eggs and vegetables and fruits that humans can eat. That's a food forest. It doesn't necessarily produce saleable yield in the same way uh, because, well, not everything is going to ripen the same way. You've got different conditions in different spots. But it means that if you are careful about um, uh, synchronizing your preservation of the goods, and if you're careful about how you establish cycles of mutual benefit between the organisms, you can do an awful lot better than industrial agriculture. So we've talked about one of the permaculture principles. Um, and so I think this is where I'd like to rope Francis into the conversation. You're still there, I hope. So, yes, I'm still here. Excellent. Okay, so um, I, I should explain immediately, Francis and I have been taking these permaculture principles and trying to generalize them to um, agile organizations, agile organization. which is to say, uh, you might want to mute for now, Francis, and come back or, or use headphones, because um, we're getting echoes. Uh, so what I'm intending, though, is that 
uh, we'll start by looking at the permaculture principle, and then we'll look at the generalization, and or it might be not be a generalization, it might be a specialization to um, uh, to the corporate world, to, or to to large financially oriented organizations, and see whether we're being fair or not. Uh, now, um, Stefan, if you would also interact with um, the folk we've got on the line who might be able to ask questions. And if you could ask questions yourself, uh, we're gonna have 12 of these principles uh, and maybe we can also look at the questions on a, a per principle basis. Well, if you have any questions, please let us know. There's a uh, Q and A function at the bottom uh, of your window uh, where you can post questions. Cool beans. All right, so. Uh, the permaculture principle, the very first one, observe and interact by taking time to engage with nature, we can design solutions that suit our particular situation. The first time we saw this, uh, Francis and I immediately recognized this is very similar to um, uh, the lean ideas about um, uh, uh, Genshi Genbutsu Kaizen, and all of that stuff. Uh, you need to actually go to the workplace and observe what's going on. There's also very similar to the uh, Agile principle, principle uh, I think it's the ninth one from the manifesto, that face-to-face um, -face communication is the most effective way uh, for information to pass into and between members of a team. So uh, we thought this could be, if it was specialized to Agile organizations, observe and interact business design and technical stakeholders must work together as peers face to face to design solutions that fit each other's constraints. Francis, what do you think? I think we've, um, the key part that we wanted to take was that nature in an organization has a different reference to the permaculture nature and mm. the, the mapping into the different stakeholders is they're all the different touch points that people in the organization deal with. So we're very clear that uh, the principles we're working on are for the people in the organization because organizations are made out of people and agile organizations acknowledge that. Yeah, very well said, man. Um, the, the, the beauty of this is that, well, nature is a set of organisms that are interacting and an organization is a set of people that are interacting. So I think it's a, a very natural way to put it. Any questions so far, Stefan? Nope, not on my side. All good. Then let's go on to the second one of these. So the permaculture principle, catch and store energy by developing systems that collect resources at peak abundance, we can use them in times of need. So this goes to, um, well, things as simple as batteries to collect uh, solar energy or other means of energy storage, but it also goes to very fundamental biological uh, resources. We have various different organisms yielding useful resources and if we preserve them uh, then we get to use them later on. This is kind of the fundamental of agriculture as opposed to hunting and collecting. Well, in, a, in generalizing this uh, to human organizations, we realized originally we were thinking about money as energy. We went, no, that's money's just an information system. What, what really generates the ability to, um, to break through constraints is learning. So capture and store learning in small autonomous cross-functional teams. As these teams satisfy current constraints, they become capable of breaking through future bottlenecks. Now you might immediately think, well, wait a second, we have knowledge bases, we, we write things down. That's how we store our learning. But you would then have to activate that learning by getting people to read this stuff. In your small autonomous cross-functional team, you have an immediate living embodiment of the learning and it's enormously valuable to your organization. Uh, it's a tremendous accelerator on its ability to cope with external change. Um, and the starvation that happens naturally when one or another value stream begins to, to tap out. Francis, what do you think? So one thing that we worked hard to capture was um, the, the now and the then-ness of that principle. And when you translate energy from uh, in, into human organizations, 
the now and the then is really about capability and capacity. And, and really, we wanted to really make sure that organisations were focused on, uh, you know, losing that old school practice of breaking, continuously breaking and reforming teams at the whim of the organisation. It's okay if the teams break and reform because they will carry their learnings with them as they carry their relationships from team to team. And as we can uh, carry those forward, then uh, those relationships stand the organisation in good stead and take those uh, learnings into the future. Mm. So this goes to um, product management instead of project management and stream funding instead of budgets. Um, so yes, it's a very powerful principle to apply in an agile organization, but um, I, I think there's something else to it. Uh, and it has to do with this idea of future bottlenecks. We, we often have very short term thinking that underpins the, the, the breaking apart and then rehiring of, of individual resources and uh, software developers think of it as a, a sausage factory where the organization treats them as re replaceable, interchangeable, not recognizing that their learning about technical constraints is every bit as valuable as the business stakeholders learning about business constraints or the designers learning about design constraints. Stefan, any questions? Not so far. Okie dokie. Do, do feel free to ask them yourself. Yeah, I do so, I do so. I'm, I'm not shy. <laughs> I haven't noticed you being shy. Okay, so next one. Um, I love this one. Uh, obtain a yield. Ensure that you are getting truly useful rewards as part of the work that you're doing. So, so the idea here is that it, it doesn't do you very much good uh, to be building a beautiful food forest in your small holding farm if you're not able to find a way to sustain yourself in doing so. You have various needs to interact with the rest of the human world and um, you better make certain that you're getting useful rewards as part of the work you're doing, not just planning for the future. This goes to uh, Agile's idea about maximizing return on investment by getting your features to market early and often rather than building up a lot of wasteful inventory of software features or components that you can't bring to market yet. You want to continuously integrate, continuously deliver, continuously deploy. So, obtain a yield. Teams must measure and optimize their contribution to top line business throughput as a result of the work they're doing. Now, this is uh, where we have, we were talking about throughput accounting last time. Um, we have a bit of agile heresy because the whole agile world is very focused on the idea of velocity. We're trying to do what I said before, we're trying to deliver and deploy this stuff. If we don't focus on the benefit, the outcomes, if we're not using feedback from that, those outcomes uh, to guide our prioritization, if instead we go, we've got whoever these very powerful product managers or hippos in the room, if those of the are the highest paid person's opinion hippo. Um, if that's what dominates our decision making uh, and our prioritization, well, then we're not going to maximize the benefit that is paying for us being here. So in other words, we're not obtaining a yield because we're not even sharing the information about the product analytics and the uh, company's financials. So this is where the open book management stuff that we talked about um, uh, the last two times is vitally important. Francis? You know, there's, um, there's a really sneaky point in here. So mm. to contribute to top line business throughput, the team needs to be cross-functional. I think I think you may be suffering from bad bandwidth, mate. Uh, Stefan, are you getting Francis or not? No. Francis, you're breaking off. Yeah, we can't hear you. Mm, it's very melodic, though. Yeah. It sounds quite a lot like Forbidden Planet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Francis. Uh, Francis. Fr 
Francis? Francis, can you hear us? Hello? Uh, let's see. Hang on. If we look at the chat. Uh, ah, maybe I can type the answer here. So Francis can hear us. All right. Um, by all means, type. Um, I, I think if you've got your video on, you might want to turn it off. But uh, if it's not on, then, then life's like that. Uh, okay, so the cross-functional team can interpret and add value to top-line and that's all it says. Okay, um, I think, oh hang on, to top-line a non-cross-functional team will be limited in its contribution. Ah, excellent point. Uh, non-cross-functional teams, uh, component teams, uh, they, they don't have the skills to be able to collectively put out features to be able to contribute to top-line throughput. I think that um, that also goes to the structure of value streams and portfolios. Now, I'm going to assume that Francis will get his bandwidth situation under control, maybe by tethering through his phone uh, with a bit of luck. Uh, Cross-funk teams are autonomous. Storm too big. Ah, we do have a, um, a nasty uh, thunderstorm right, racing through Sydney at the moment. So Francis is in the southern suburbs. So um, let's just keep our fingers crossed that after the next bit of me waxing lyrical, we'll have him back. <sighs> so, any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> There's a question from Mel. If there was only one thing I could change, this would be the one. I'm not sure that whether this is a statement or a question. Mel, could you elaborate on this a bit? Are you looking for the one thing to change, probably? I'm curious about that, too. Uh, well, look, we only have a few people on. Stefan, would you like to... Um to add Mel to the, the panel. She's, as I understand it, Mel's got a fair amount of permaculture experience. And Agile as well. It's a statement. Uh, why even do projects or change if you're not focused on the business outcome? Exactly. Mel, you can talk. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, let me, can you hear me? We can um, indeed, go ahead. Cool. <laughs> yeah, um, really, if, if there was only one thing that I could change, this would be it. Most projects start with, oh, uh, we want to implement System X. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's a good question. I wonder why we didn't ask why before. <laughs> so what you're saying is you agree with the principle, but it, you don't yeah. see it in your clients. Exactly, yeah. Um, it, most projects start with we want to implement System X and they only take responsibility up to we've implemented six M System X. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's not the start or the end. It's, it should be about well, what is the thing mm -hmm. that you want to be able to do that you can't do now? Yes. What's the business capability or what is the market impact? I completely yep. agree. That's why I, I love this principle so much because it just seems uh, when I first saw the permaculture version, it, it was blindingly obvious to me that we had to do this, that yep. uh, uh, we have to be able to bring this into the corporate world because so much of the crappy impact that corporations have on uh, uh, the ecosphere is caused by this kind of incredibly short term thinking. Uh, where we've decided we want to build a mine next to a reef. We've decided we want to have a gas pipeline going through a river. All of the nonsense that causes enormous uh, environmental impacts is because of uh, the fact that we are measuring things without considering their proper yield. Um, and while, okay, maybe some religion somewhere is right and we're all about to be called into heaven where no doubt it rains every day and you've got as much water as you could possibly use. Uh, it, well, that also might not happen for an awfully long time. You've got to kind of make it here. So, okay with me going on? Yes, please. Please, yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, and I don't mind uh, saying, yes, I'm, I'm being a bit utopian in statements like that, but um, really what we're doing with Agile has a utopian flavor to it as well. And the reason that that's fair is that it, it has an enormous benefit to the businesses we're working with. So a utopian mindset isn't so bad. And we'll see that in the 12th principle when we get to it. Okay. Apply self-regulation and accept feedback. We need to discourage inappropriate activity to ensure that systems can continue to function well. And in a permaculture uh, context, as I understand it, inappropriate activity uh, is activity where uh, either we are consuming non-renewable resources or we're producing resources that are not being consumed. There's this lovely example in um, one of the permaculture books. It was a, something Mollison said to Holmgren um, about um, a farm that was afflicted with, with a lot of snails. And, uh, and Holmgren said to Mollison, well, okay, here you go, because uh, Mollison was, uh, was the, the elder of the two. And as I understand it, there was a certain apprentice period, but I might be getting that wrong. Anyway, um, Mollison, uh, uh, stood there looking at the snails. Holmgren said, what, what do we do about this except you know, break out the pesticides? And Mollison said, the problem here is not too many snails. The problem is too few ducks. Because, of course, ducks eat snails and they turn them into duck eggs, which you can eat. So uh, the idea of closing the loops to be able to maximize productivity comes at, uh, uh, at, at this idea of appropriate versus inappropriate. And that's true inside the organizations we work with as well. The systems can continue to function well. Well, let's try generalizing it. So um, align teams into self-managing value streams that continuously adapt their work priorities to changing market feedback. Maybe we're more specializing in generalizing. Francis, are you there? Here's something. I see something in a chat. Yep, it says. Uh, try turning on your microphone. It might work this time. He says, very important to can, know. Can you, you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Hey. Go ahead. A bit unstable. So it's really important that uh, we don't hide the negative feedback from the teams. Mm. So you can't self-regulate when you only get positive news. Oh, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great. You don't know where to improve. And so um, neg negative feedback is just as valuable as the positive feedback. Mm -hmm. Even more so. Mm. Um, this goes to, to Mel's point as well, that uh, uh, why are we delivering these systems? Well, we might have had a good reason to begin with, but without the negative feedback, we might not have a good reason anymore. And there we are wasting money doing it. Yes, it's, it, it's very easy for projects to continue to obsolescence. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. so once again, we've got that concept that the team maybe isn't as autonomous as we think it is. All we've got is uh, like free spinning wheels. We don't really have cars that drive themselves. Yes. Uh, so that's the self-managing. There's an aspect of um, self-reliance in the, the discussion of the original permaculture principle that um, uh, we sort of, one of the things we're trying to do with this is keep the principles nice and short. And so if we had said self-directing portfolios of self-managing streams of self-organizing teams, I didn't feel that that was really going to be adding much value to the, to the way the principle reads. Um, but what we're going to have to do with all of these is produce a, a bunch of nice illustrations that will make the, the full breadth of the principles application clear. Now, shall we move on? Yes, please. Take, take that for a yes. Okay. Uh, all right, next. So... Use and value renewable resources and services. Make the best use of nature's abundance to reduce our consumptive behavior and dependence on non-renewable resources. Uh, this takes us into ideas about um, self-sufficiency for these small holding farms. Some of them, uh, after uh, many years, may even get to the point where they're 
completely off the grid. They're only using the resources on the farm itself. But of course, for most people who like permaculture, they're still dependent on the support of the rest of society. Um, once upon a time, and the rest of society wasn't able to provide that support. And one of the premises in permaculture is that um, society will eventually run out of fossil fuels to, to keep it in its going in its current mode. Uh, this is a, a, an idea called energy descent. And then everybody's going to have to leave the cities and go back on the land. That was in the 70s, people, uh, where there were a lot of sort of doom and gloom sayers. And I'm not certain that Holmgren would be particularly hung up on the idea that that's not necessarily going to happen. In fact, I don't think he is anymore. I think he's more of the mind that the, the wastes that we are producing and the consumptive behavior that we are using with our non-renewable resources, that that's still something that can kill us. It's just that it isn't necessarily only fossil fuels. Uh, if you look at NPK fertilizer and a bunch of mineral ores, uh, the, that point's just as, as good as it was before. Happily, um, I mentioned before that uh, we have uh, technologies to do with alga culture uh, that might be able to solve part of the problem. Uh, we're able to engineer edible algae that has just about exactly the right uh, profile of um, amino acids and protein and so on and fats and you know, uh, that humans could live on. It doesn't necessarily taste like anything other than, well, green stuff, uh, although apparently some of it tastes good. But over the next uh, decade or two, we will probably be able to engineer that into a replacement for agriculture. Uh, we can also use 3D printing for our, not just the stuff in our houses, but the houses themselves. We already have 3D printers for houses. We can use augmented reality so that we can meet without having to visit each other in cafes and cities. Uh, we have plenty of renewable energy resources coming up. And uh, if we're able to replace agriculture with agriculture, we'll have no end of living space and human population is stabilizing. If it wasn't for the fact that we're heading for apparently a climate catastrophe well we'd be looking pretty cute um the energy descent thing is not important to the value of um permaculture you don't have to buy off on the premise to see that the principles have general application to efficiently effectively and rapidly developing healthy ecosystems whether biological or business so uh, I think the, the conversation about the premise, that's a really interesting conversation, but not one we'll go into right now. Let's look at the specialization of this. Share resources and services across value streams as much as possible. Motivate mutual benefit for teams and streams to reduce silos, dependencies, and missed opportunities. Well, uh, this goes to uh, a lot of the game theoretic stuff we were doing in our last podcast or one before. It goes to open book management. Um, it, it has to do as well with um, the communication structures and leadership protocols that we've talked about over the last little while. We, we talked about uh, chapters and councils, representative councils, the Iroquois stuff. Uh, all of that goes to motivating mutual benefit. But the key here is we want the benefit that we are gathering um, to be measured in terms of actual top line business throughput and we want the rewards to be hooked up to it that's how we're able to motivate mutual benefit if everybody's working to individual kpis and okrs that aren't hooked up to uh, movement of the top line then we don't get the kind of growth that we have in something like uh, Springfield Remanufacturing Corporation we looked at last time where they grew 234,000% in 25 years. Um, so uh, I, I thought that this was a, a, a also something that goes to, um, because it's about sharing, it goes to the ideas of open source, open content. Um, maybe not so open that you're sharing with the outside world, but within the organization, open book management is about sharing the information, the top line information that people need to be able to make well-informed decisions and to motivate them to make decisions that are good for each other, rather than just good for one or the other. Francis, you, know, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this one, and I think this is uh, the sharing economy gone full circle. So we started off with open source, 
Uh, and then, and then we had the external manifestation, the, the Ubers and everybody saying, ah, oh, we'll get everybody else to do our work and then we'll take a skim over the top of that. And this really pulls it back inside the organization. If we break down our, our silos and we share our information, other people will generate value out of our information. And so then they have incentive in many directions to, um, share those OKRs and other resources um, so we consume less externally and we can produce more within this, within the groups and within our own personal set of interactions. Hmm. The collective ownership principle that was in XP to begin with and which we, we have in the, the Xscale manifesto it was not unfortunately included in the original Agile manifesto goes to that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it just brings it back in because that, that we see in, in many teams, they, they've lost that bit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it goes to, to um, uh, decentralized version control and um, uh, all of the sharing of tests as well. Uh, and for that matter, the sharing of data. Really, what we'd like to see is that um, anyone who needs to be able to touch some part of the resources or services of some value stream uh, that they're able to do so with a minimum of fuss uh, while still maintaining alignment with the needs of the other streams. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Every, anything in the organization. So open book, open book accounting goes, yes. is also related to this bit. Yeah. Cool. So uh, any questions? Shall we go on? Let's go on. We already exceeded the time frame. So. Okay. Uh, I figured since we're uh, asking questions as we go, it won't be too bad. Unless, Stefan, you're going to have to head out early. Uh -huh. Go on. Okay. Um, all right. Produce, I'll try to go faster. Though. Produce no waste. Uh, by valuing and making use of all the resources that are available to us, nothing goes to waste. So um, this is more than waste in the lean sense. Uh, uh, this is also waste in the sense of pollution. Um, well, uh, mercilessly refactor value streams, reuse, recycle, or reduce all the outputs their teams produce until nothing goes to waste. This merciless refactoring idea came from extreme programming. It was about making certain we didn't have uh, duplication and uh, pathological dependencies and uh, 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 things that were not um, self-documenting in our code base. There's no reason that that doesn't generalize perfectly to value streams as a whole. The fact that refactoring is something that is regarded as geeky because the word itself has a lot of syllables is just sad. What refactoring is really about is simplifying by reusing, recycling, or reducing outputs until there is every output is being used. So for example, um, a, there are a bunch of Swedish uh, factories where the exhaust gases of the factory in the winter time are piped through um, living spaces to warm the living spaces. So you don't get more wasteful than waste heat. Uh, they've found ways to um, reuse it. Uh, and if we think about the reduction end of this, it might not seem economical to do. But the more waste the more we're producing a rod for our own back that was as true in software as it is for physical resources of value streams francis have a go you know i i've seen many agile teams and i've been to many conferences where they talk about how awesome they are and all the wonderful funky stuff they've shipped and how they did do some technical debt reduction but but really they haven't reconsidered their business cases um, and look to refactor um, all the things that they produce. So their test results could go into log systems and their log systems could feed back into their other systems. And the, it's really hard. The, the, the agile principle that was there has been so watered down in its interpretation um, that I heard an agile trainer the other day say that it's really about designing them better so that there's less waste when you start the work. <laughs> well, this also goes to like say 4.5's definition of refactoring is something uh -huh. that must be planned and estimated and prioritized along with other work. No, 
merciless refactoring. You have to pay down your technical debt continuously. And okay. that's why I said, you know, we have to be explicit that we yes. want that refactor word here um, because it yes. was just it was just getting lost in the message. There's so many flavors of, of the Agile thing and we know that that intention has been lost. Yes, beautiful. Okay, uh, Stefan, shall we go on? Depends on how long that would take. Uh, we're beyond okay, the how long do you have? Because what we could do is do a part two. Yeah, I think that sounds sounds more appropriate. Because otherwise All right. To rush. So then what we should probably do with this, um, we'll wrap up here, but I should also mention that the first six permaculture principles, and for that matter, the first six ecosystems thinking principles are really kind of the micro level principles about individuals and teams. The second six are the macro ones about portfolios and organizations. So next time we are going to dig deep on this and hopefully Mel, you'll be able to come along as well. So do. Fantastic, we'll invite you. All right, folks. Um, Stefan, do you want to wrap us up? Well, gentlemen, thanks a lot for the interesting idea of uh, aligning uh, biological systems with our uh, metier of, of doing business. I find this very interesting, and I'm looking forward to continue this. Um, Fantastic. Will you make a suggestion? Probably next Friday. That's yeah, nice. I think that's a good idea. Let's do it. All right. Mel, you're on too? Yep. Beautiful. Awesome. Okay, folks. Well, um, I guess that wraps it up for another Xscale podcast. Thank you all. Likewise. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Take care, Stephen. Francis. No. Bye.